international perspectives. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Fran. Okay, so starting again. So, Professor Viviane, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us for the, the episode nine from season three of our seminar series, International Perspectives of Corpus Technology for Language Learning. It's organized by the University of Queensland and uh, Sao Paulo State University in Brazil. And uh, today's talk by Professor Viviane Cortes uh, will focus on genre and corpora in the English for academic writing class, the case of lexical bundles. It's a very interesting issue. I'm sure everybody is looking forward to it. So uh, before we begin, um, as I'm representing Peter today, right, University of Queensland, I'm going to share a file with you, which is the knowledge of the country. So just let me just share that with you. So here you have the acknowledgement of the country. Uh, the University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodianship of, land, of the lands and on which we meet. We pay respect to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valued contributions to Australian global society. Okay. And then, and as I was saying, so here is the flyer from uh, Viviane Stock, Professor Viviane Stock. And uh, just a minute, please, because I have big problems with the with sharing the files, sorry. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about Professor Viviani. Uh, just a short introduction because she will talk about her uh, career and then connect to her talk. So Dr. Viviani Cortes is Associate Professor of Applied Linguistics and English as a Second Language at Georgia State University in the United States. Her research interests focus on formulaic language registry studies and the use of corpora and corpus tools in the teaching of English for specific purposes. Her publications can be found in the Journal of English for Academic Purposes, Linguistics and Education, and Applied Linguistics, among other important journals, and in many edited volumes. She's currently one of the editors-in-chief of English for Specific Purposes. So Professor Viviani, now the floor is all yours. So I'm sure everybody's looking for your talk. Thank you for being here with us. So you can begin. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. I think it should be fine. Can you see it? Yes. Excellent. So um, the impetus for this talk um, came uh, um, when uh, Peter invited me um, a couple of months ago. And um, I had just come back from the um, American Association of Applied Linguistics Conference in Pittsburgh here in the United States. And um, at the end of my talk, that was also on lexical bundles, and I'm going to talk about those expressions today. Um, someone asked me a question. Um, in the question and answer session. Um, the question was, how do you teach bundles? It's what I call the $1 million question because I've been asked that question for many years. Um, and so um, when Peter invited me to give this talk, I thought I wanted to reflect upon um, providing a, a, an answer to that question that was a bit more comprehensive. So before starting to talk about genre and corpora and bundles, I want to introduce myself so that you have an idea um, of where I come from, okay, um, professionally and also personally. Um, uh, this is the outline of the talk. I want to introduce myself, then I'm going to uh, talk about my experience with corporate in the classroom. I want to get into lexical bundles and I want to uh, uh, share with you how I go from research to the classroom. Um, I want to also give you some new developments um, and some suggestions for future work. Um, for those of you who do not too much about me, 
I was born and raised in Buenos Aires, Argentina, um, and I did my undergraduate studies at the Universidad Tecnológica Nacional in the teacher training program they have there. And my major was um, teaching English and teaching English for science and technology. So in a couple of minutes, you're going to see that my life has been for a circle professionally. Um, I uh, worked in Buenos Aires teaching English as a foreign language and English for specific purposes at every single level of education. So I, I work as a an elementary school teacher, Midland High School teacher. I was the head of the English department of the private high school for a couple of years. And I also work at the um, American Argentinian Binational Center for many years, which in the 80s and 90s was a wonderful place to work because it had um, a lot of very novel technologies and, and approaches to teaching. I... Um, uh, I then decided that I wanted to pursue graduate studies, and I did a master's program in TESOL, teaching English as a second language, at California State University in Los Angeles. It was a special program because we didn't have to go to Los Angeles to take all the classes. We, um, we uh, The professors came to Buenos Aires and uh, taught the co a whole cohort of students. Um, we only came for one quarter to take a couple of classes in California. Um, when I graduated from my master's program, um, my teachers encouraged me to go on to a PhD. Um, I was not very sure I wanted to become a researcher. Okay, I was very happy being a teacher. Um, but um, some changes in my, li my life made me think about it. And so I applied to only three programs in the United States and I was lucky enough to be accepted in the three of them. But I chose the program at Northern Arizona University because um, my teachers in California told me that it was a small program up and coming with um, a lot of interaction between teachers and students. And that was very attractive to me. So that's how I ended up at the San Francisco peaks that you can see in that picture in Flagstaff, Arizona, where I spent the best and worst four years of my life. And for the people who have been in PhD programs, you must understand what I mean. I never thought I was going to stay in the United States, um, but um, I applied for jobs uh, just to think what was happening. And I got a wonderful job at Iowa State University in uh, Ames, Iowa, where I had a lot of support to develop my research and also my teaching. Uh, some of the things that I am going to present today started in, uh, my, when I had my job in Ames. I, um, I worked there for six years and I was promoted to associate professor, but my health was not very good because I'm not a person to live in cold weather. And uh, for those of you who have been to the United States and know where AMC is, it's a very cold place with very long winters from October to May. So I tried to find a job in a warmer place. And I didn't want to sacrifice the quality of the job though. And, um, and so I got my current job at Georgia State University um, in Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta is a big city with mild temperatures. Um, that is um, a view of the city from my office. And um, that picture with the blue lights, uh, that's the um, front of the, my office building, 25 Park Place. Um, it's uh, Georgia State is an urban university um, that, where I have wonderful students. I teach graduate classes there. Um, and this is more or less my current situation. I'm a professor at Georgia State. I am, uh, as Adrian said, I am uh, the co-editor-in-chief of English for Specific Purposes. That's why I say that my academic career has been full circle because my major in undergraduate studies was English for Science and Technology. And now I am the editor of this really very important journal in our field. I am very active in the American Association of Applied Linguistics and also at TESOL. And I wrote that Fulbright, uh, I included that Fulbright sign there because I was just awarded a Fulbright International Scholar Award. And I'm gonna be doing research about academic writing in Sao Paulo from February to um, uh, June next year. So if you are in Sao Paulo or in the Sao Paulo area, get in touch and maybe we can meet for a cup of coffee. Um, so this is more or less my um, situation. At Georgia State, I teach um, 
in, uh, English grammar, and I teach uh, corpus-based discourse analysis. I also um, um, teach, although not very frequently, um, uh, an, an academic writing class for international graduate students. And I am also the associate director for the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning, um, where I am the associate uh, director for intercultural communication. So let's get into our topic today, corpora from research to the classroom. I, um, I want to share with you my experience in using corpora in the classroom in, the, in, in academic writing and my experience with data driven learning. So I've always been um, very much interested in, um, in how people learn uh, to write academically in any language. I don't know who, because I can never cite who said this, but um, academic writing in English is a second language to everybody, no matter what your first language is. So I could never take an academic writing class um, because uh, the universities where I did my graduate studies didn't offer any academic writing classes. Um, so my journey towards becoming an academic writer was um, self-taught and very painful. And, however, when I arrived at Iowa State University, I um, got into this fantastic program for academic skills that they have. I don't know if the program is the same now. Um, you will have the chance of knowing more about it in the next um, talk in the series, which is by Elena Kotos, who was my student when I was at Iowa State. Um, so she will tell you more about the, the academic um, program that they have there, um, academic communication program. So um, the idea is this is a huge program because Iowa State has a lot of second language um, in, students, okay, students whose first language is not English. Uh, so when a students, no matter what standardized tests they took, when students arrive at Iowa State in the period where I work there, they had to take a battery of tests that were prepared in-house. Um, so um, they, um, they had to take these tests and then um, if they passed all the tests, they were, they were congratulated and they could go into their classes, in their disciplinary classes. But if they didn't, they had to take um, a bunch of classes, academic writing, academic listening, speaking, academic reading. Um, I was in charge of teaching an academic writing class for international graduate students. And I taught that class the six years that I worked at Iowa State. So when I arrived, um, they um, offered me um, the class and I could observe how the class was taught. So I went to see a colleague who was teaching the class, someone um, passed me a syllabus and they showed me the textbook that they had been using. Um, for those of you who have worked in the United States, that is more or less the way that when you arrive at a university, you start teaching classes, okay? Particularly if you come straight from your PhD or from, from your graduate program. So this international, um, academic writing for international graduate students was taught in a traditional setting. That means that a regular classroom, it was a face-to-face -face class. The class covered the teaching of various genres, from memos, summaries, book and article reviews, oral presentations, even though it was an academic writing class, but oral presentations were included, and then research reports. And it was text-based because all the sections of that class used the same textbook. It was a textbook that was very popular in the 90s, even though this was already in the 2000s, and that was called Writing Up Research, okay? So I taught that class following the same curriculum that everybody else was following, probably my first semester and a bit of the second semester I was there. But then I realized something was not completely right. So because I am an ESP person, I am a firm believer in needs analysis. 
So um, what I did is I did a needs analysis to see if the course that I was teaching and that we were offering was meeting the needs of our international graduate students. So my needs analysis had um, student interviews, faculty interviews, and also document analysis. I interviewed the students to see how they were feeling to um, get information about their, the perceived effectiveness of the course. Also for faculty, faculty in the English department who were teaching the course and, and faculty in the disciplines who were sending their students to the course. Um, and then I did document analysis. Um, I collected syllabi from different um, courses, uh, particularly those uh, programs um, that sent a lot of students okay, to, uh, take it, to take that class. Um, also, I um, asked teachers if they could share assignment prompts from writing activities and writing assignments that the students have to do, had to do. Um, and so um, I studied everything and I could see that effect, in, in reality, the course that we were offering, we are not meeting the needs of the students. At least some students reported some concerns in the interviews. So they said that the course was perceived as helpful. They could see that they were writing so much that their writing was getting better. But um, there were two things that really called my attention. The first one was their concern that there was not enough time to cover all the genres that the course um, <clears throat> was offering in detail. And then the lack of discipline specific materials. I remember several students in the interviews um, using the same expression, uh, something like, you know what, um, um, I think that the, the, um, the course is, is useful, but in my discipline, we don't write like that. So that expression um, that, of frustration was also mine, okay, because I had 20 students in each section of that class that I taught, and um, those 20 students were probably from 20 different disciplines. You had a, someone who was doing a PhD in computer science sitting next to someone who was um, a, taking, a, a coming from um, psychology, sitting next to someone from applied linguistics, sitting next to a mathematician. So how could I learn how those, all those disciplines wrote and, and how could I teach my students um, how those disciplines wrote? So um, going back to the literature and reflecting a lot about the course, we decided on a new course design. And this new course was going to be based on authentic texts, genre specificity and disciplinarity. Um, authentic text, because the concern was in my discipline, they don't write like this. The examples in the textbook do not reflect the writing in my discipline. Then genre specificity, because the concern of the students was that they, they were looking at genres that probably they didn't need, and they were not having enough time to look at the research article, with what, which was what they needed to write. Um, and then disciplinarity, so that each of each student could concentrate on the writing of their own disciplines. And that's how this new corpus-based, genre-based class came into, into um, came to a, real, a realization. The class was taught in a computer lab with a maximum of 20 students. And because I got a grant, I had money and a lot of assistance. For the first semesters when I taught the class, each student had a corpus of research papers from journals in, in their disciplines that was collected for them. And um, the corpus was uh, collected with a good size and um, appropriate representativeness. Um, we consulted professors in the field to collect the corpus. And so the students started the course with materials already on their computer environments. Um, they were using concordance in software, and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that. In those days, there was no freeware. And so I created my own concordance in software for students uh, so that they could use it and we didn't have to pay for a commercially available concordance. 
The materials were based on empirical studies on schema theory based on swales, um, 1981 and um, 1999, and then all the other studies that follow the um, soils approach to move and step analysis. Um, students work on worksheets. They had readings that came from published studies in applied linguistics that um, reported findings on how different sections of the research article were written. And then they explored the corpus um, with some corpus exercises. They had to complete those exercises in the computer lab or they could do at home, uh, the exercise at home. Um, for some exercises, they needed the use of the concordance, and then they wrote final reports for each section. The final, the final paper for the course was a research paper that they were writing for another class in which they could show what they learned in the class. Um, a couple of semesters down the road, um, I could do a study in which I compared in a corpus-based and a non-corpus-based class, meaning the curriculum of the class was the same, but one class was taught in a regular environment and the other one was taught in a computer lab. Um, they had the same materials, but one, one of the sections, the one on the computer lab had a corpus and the other one only looked at four hard copies of papers. Um, the papers were selected by the students with their advisors, and, um, and they did the same type of exercises, okay, and they looked at the same materials. And one of the differences was that some of the in-class activities, the students in the uh, non-corpus, no, no, no computer class, um, had to do um, in handwriting, and there was a lot of complaint about that, because we are not used to handwriting anymore. Um, of course, the um, assignments that they did at home, they did on the computers. And it, this was, I, I'm telling you, this was probably 2007, 2006. And um, the issue was not everybody had a laptop to bring to class. Um, I did a study in which I compared the writing across the two sections. I had a group of writers who assessed 10 introductions, and I chose the introduction because it was short and also because it, it's the, the most regular across disciplines. The five writers were outstanding researchers in the academic writing field. Um, we had a writing session. We used a four-point rubric adapted from Stoller et al. And then um, we had very high inter-writer reliability, probably 0.98. And then there was no significant difference because both courses had advanced a lot in their, in their academic writing from the beginning to the end of the semester. They had improved considerably, but the use of the corpus didn't cause much difference in written production. The, um, probably the, the um, advancement, uh, the gains that they had uh, came from analyzing the genre, okay, and analyzing the language. But just using the computer and the corpus hadn't made much of a difference. Um, it made a difference in motivation though, because um, there, I also interviewed the students and there was a survey that they completed and uh, it was funny because the students didn't know about the existence of the other class. Uh, so for the people that were in the computer um, class, they uh, said that they would have liked to have less papers to analyze. And for the people that were in the no computer class, they, their concern was that they would have liked to have more papers to analyze. So that shows that you cannot make everybody happy. Um, but for example, one student that was in the, um, in the no computer class, um, who was in, in the College of Education in Instructional Technology, he described the computer class. So there was a question in the interview saying, so um, what, what would you think if this class were, was, were offered in a computer lab? And, and so he immediately described the whole, the whole class. He said, oh, you could have a lot of papers. He didn't know the, way, the word corpus. You could have a lot of papers to analyze and probably use some software to go through. The so he didn't know that the other class existed, but in his mind, it did exist. Now, 
Um, that is my experience with teaching corpora and genre in the class. Um, in those days, when I was teaching that class, I hadn't made the connection between um, uh, rhetorical moves and lexical bundles. But since then, I have been working on that. And so I think that if I were to teach that class again, um, I would do some of the things that I want to share with you uh, in this next section. I have been working with lexical bundles since my dissertation, and that was a long time ago. In fact, it was the topic of my dissertation. Lexical bundles, for those of you who may not be familiar with them, are sequences of three or more words that commonly go together in natural discourse. So they are expressions of three or more words that um, frequently occur together. They are identified empirically with a specially designed computer program. Nowadays, there are lots of programs that you can use that are freeware. When I did my dissertation, I had to create my own. Um, now, um, lexical bundles have only one quality. They are very frequent. Um, so we really need to respect that very high frequency so that we know that they are lexical bundles and not um, words that came together just by chance. Um, there are some conventional thresholds for frequency and range, um, 10 times per million words, 20 times per million words. I'm of the idea that the more conservative you are with the threshold, the better, so that you are sure that those expressions are in fact very frequent. Okay, so I usually use 20 times in a million or 40 times in a million. I don't want to have too many expressions, I want to have salient expressions. And then you also want some range or dispersion so that you make sure that the expressions that you're working with um, are not idiosyncratic of only one or a few authors. So you can choose five, five texts in a corpus, 10% of the text in your corpus, they are conventional, so you can decide. Um, Lexical bundles can be considered building blocks. And because they can be considered building blocks, I'm going to talk a little bit more about building blocks in a little bit. I think that that is a very important um, quality, okay, that lexical bundles have. Expressions of four words, examples of four words lexical bundles are expressions like as a result of, on the other hand, in the context of, as well as they. As you can see, they are not complete units. They are usually fragments of grammatical uh, constructs. Like for example, a prepositional phrase with the fragment of a noun phrase or a noun phrase with a fragment of a prepositional phrase embedded. Now, you may think that lexical bundles um, and n-grams are the same, but there is a little difference. All lexical bundles are n-grams, but not all n-grams are lexical bundles, because in order to be a lexical bundle, an n-gram that is a trigram, four-gram, five-gram, needs to meet those uh, frequency and range thresholds. Then it becomes a lexical bundle. So, I had done some attempts at uh, teaching bundles. Um, one I did, well, while I was at Northern Arizona University. So when I was collecting data for my dissertation, um, a professor in history was teaching um, a writing intensive class. So he was helping me collect a student writing for my dissertation. And he said, next semester, I'm teaching um, an, a writing intensive class in history. Would you like to come during the semester to work with the students to teach lexical bundles? And I said, yes, I could develop some modules and go different times during the semester to, first of all, raise awareness of what lexical bundles are, and help the students notice the use of lexical bundles, and practice recognizing the bundles. And so that's what I did. I collected the student writing at the beginning, in the middle and at the end of the semester. And then I went, I, I designed these four interventions when I went to class and we talked about bundles. I got a list of bundles from the readings that they had that semester. So from the research articles and the, um, the textbooks that they, that they read, I made a small corpus and got a list of bundles that I share with the students. We looked at examples in context from the readings that they had in their classes. Unfortunately, the results were inconclusive. So when I 
measure the number and the quality of the bundles that they used in the three um, points in time where I collected data, the, um, the use of bundles was all over the place. So some bundles that were frequently used at the beginning were not used at the end. And maybe in, in, the, in the middle point of the semester, students were using some bundles, but then at the end, they were not using them anymore. Um, I interviewed some of the students. Everybody said that they felt comfortable using bundles, that now they knew what they were. Some students said, I had a list that I tried to resort to when I'm writing, but unfortunately the writing at the end of the semester didn't show the improvement or the, the gains that I thought it was going to show. Probably I should have <clears throat> continued collecting data a couple of semesters later to see if the teaching of bundles had had an, an impact, but there was attrition. I left the university because I graduated. And so um, I, I, didn't, I didn't continue collecting. That's a big limitation. Now, as I said before, um, we are always trying to find building blocks in this course because we would like our students to, um, to um, be able to build their discourse without a, a lot of difficulty. So I always thought that we had to try to merge bundles and moves because for example, many researchers like Biber, Connor and Upton said that move type can be seen as main building blocks of a genre. I see moves and steps as building blocks when you look at um, a discourse from a top-down perspective. So you can identify these moves and steps as big building blocks. And lexical bundles can also be used as text building blocks, but I see them as building blocks from a bottom-up perspective. When you look at the, at the text and you start looking at those bundles and put them together like Legos, okay? Highland maintains that bundles have been increasingly seen as, import, as important building blocks of discourse. So I thought that this bundle move connection could be a good solution for with a good teaching a, a pedagogical application, a good teaching application. So um, I did a study that was quite exploratory, to be honest, um, which was published in 2013, um, in which I looked at research article interactions and I, um, and I tried to identify the bundles in the moves in the interactions where, where they occur. Um, I looked at, a, I collected a, a corpus of introductions, I found the uh, bundles, I analyzed them structurally and functionally as we usually do in the, in, 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 with a standard procedure. And then I matched the bundle and to the move and steps. A lot of articles and a lot of studies have been done since then from different sections of the research article. People have extended the methodology to the use, uh, to the study of P-frames, which are discontinuous um, expressions, um, which in many cases come from lexical bundles, but have open slots. Um, and they have been trying to match these bundles and moves. Now, in a genre-based, corpus-based writing class, like the ones that I used to teach, teaching moves and steps and lexical bundles that frequently occur in those moves and steps is ideal. Now, some lexical bundles trigger, trigger the move, meaning they either start the move or show where the communicative purpose starts, the communicative purpose of the author. And those bundles can be directly transferred to the classroom, okay? So this is, um, part of a, of a um, table that is in my 2013 article. And here what you have is um, the, the move one, which is establishing a territory with the three steps. This is in fact from Swales. I said Swales 2004, but when I wrote the article, I merged all of Swales schemes for the introduction because I wanted to have as many steps as possible so that it was easier for me to see where the bundle uh, occurred. Um, and here you, you have these three steps. The bundles that are appear in, on this table um, have, be, have been found. I mean, I found them in only one step 
okay? Because there are other bundles that are more of a wild card and they are all over, but in these ones appeared in my corpus only in one step. I mean, I had an interrator, I had another rater and our interrater reliability was very high. So these were found to be in only one move and step. Meaning if you are teaching your students how to claim relevance, you can very well teach them expressions like one of the major, one of the most important, play an important role, the importance of the, and you know that those expressions are frequently used in academic um, papers in introductions to express that communicative function. Okay, so, um, so I think that that was the missing link for me, uh, trying to, now I had these building blocks, um, these two building blocks that together could help my students um, create a, like a scaffolding um, scheme for them to complete with the content of their papers. Something like this. So these bundles, for example, have been found to be extremely frequent in move two, which is preparing for present research. A step one, indicating uh, a gap or adding to what is known, or a step two, presenting positive justification. Expressions like it is necessary to, it should be noted that, the effect of the, and then for example, for indicating a gap, adding to what is known, expressions like little is known about the, there is no, it is difficult to, there is a need to, or for presenting positive justification, an, an expression like there are a number of, okay? Um, I did a, um, a, a, a sort of a presented these ones in an article that has just come up. Now, if you are going to teach bundles, and your students are not writing research articles, um, or you are teaching bundles in um, genres that have not been explored from a move a step uh, point of view, um, analyzing semantic processes and preferences in the context that surrounds the bundle can be an option. So let me show you a little bit. So um, let's start with the semantic prosody. So, the semantic prosody is often used in the analysis of left and right collocates of a search item, in this case, a lexical bundle. It's considered to be mostly negative with only a small number of effectively positive meanings. But it, depending on the um, uh, genre and the registers you are analyzing, you can find positive, negative, or neutral um, semantic prosody. So um, you have to focus on elements to the left and to the right of the lexical bundle. And classify those into positive, negative, or neutral evaluations. When I do this, I analyze the prosody separately. So I look at the left prosody first, the preceding discourse, and then after I do a, like a list of bundles, I go to the right prosody so that I am not influenced because sometimes the left prosody or the right prosody can influence the other one. Let me show you some examples, okay? Um, let me move this because I can see, okay. Um, for example, here we have the bundle, the performance of the, and on the left prosody, the preceding discourse, you have this, little attention has been paid. So as you can see, this is negative prosody. It's not something positive that you are saying. Then you have this um, in the presence of, um, and before in this succeeding, you have some positive prosody. You have the success of the resistant trait, dep trait depends primarily on the balance be between its selective advantage. So you have success and balance. These are positive words that give the whole text a positive prosody. And then you have something that is neutral, like empirical research on form focus instruction has been conducted. So there is like, there's nothing that really can tell if it is negative or prosody. It's just describing, okay? And then you have the bundle in the context of. Let me show you some examples of, of um, um, left and right prosody. And so for example, here you have the bundle as a result of. And in the first sentence, you have a um, positive positive. Um, we show that our approach results in an increased specificity of predictive transcription factor binding sites as a result of a significant reduction of noise. So there you have two positive prosodies. 
And then second one, you have negative rosaries around the same bundle. Further evidence came from patients who had suffered damage to broadcast area on, in the brain as a result of a stroke, an accident, or surgery. So in a, in a, in a corpus, it's important to, do, uh, to see what the um, most frequent prosody is for a bundle, okay? Um, there are bundles that are prone to be um, surrounded by positive uh, prosodies or negative prosodies, and that's the way that we should uh, teach them. Um, here you have, for example, as well as the, in, in the first one, it's um, left prosody neutral and right prosody neutral a bit positive, and in the second one, it's also as well as the, where you have neutral and neutral prosody. Once you have identified the prosody, you can continue on to semantic preference. And um, this refers to a common semantic field in the collocational environment of an item. So the analyst suggests labels for domains once a current theme in the context is identified. For example, here we have at the end of the, so this is a five word bundle, very frequent, particularly in, in introduction. And at the beginning in the left prosody, um, in the left uh, context, you have um, a positive, very positive prosody with a booster uh, expression, uh, highlighting results or providing further argumentation. And on the right context, you have documents or discourse. Look at these examples. The conclusion for better management strategies will be highlighted at the end of the paper. Such enhancements will be discussed further at the end of the paper. Finally, the proposed techniques are presented analytically through a case study application at the end of the paper. So there are some highlighting and some providing further argumentation and then where that is going to be. That is mostly how the, at the end of the is used in introductions. Here are some examples with has been shown too. And here you have on the left context, experiment or variable description, and on the right context, some significant or influential um, discourse. The use of program schemata has been shown to be effective for the optimization of logic programs or relax, relaxation, <clears throat> relaxation training also has been shown to improve memory functioning in the early. So nowadays, um, there are many computer programs that can identify lexical bundles. And, and once the bundles are identified, it may be not, not so easy to uh, find the bundles in their original text. So when you look at a bundle, um, you, you find a list of bundles um, with any computer program that you can get less freeware, let's say Unconc. Okay, like we all thank Lawrence Anthony for his suite of programs that are free and we can download. You can get <clears throat> a, a list of n-grams and you can make them meet the thresholds that you conventionally um, set and you get a list of bundles. And if you click on a bundle in Unconc at least, it's going to take you to the context, um, the whole text where the, the bundle appears. However, it's not easy to find, and then you can, for example, look at the semantic prosody and preference because you can look at the context around. Now, it's not very easy though to find all the bundles in a text. So, um, meet LB map. So we created, and I say we because I work with one of my former students, William Lake, we created a program that's called the lexical bundle map. We're still working on it. So um, if you are in desperate, in desperate need, get in touch with us and we may help you. But the program is going to be available freely in a couple of months. So the computer program maps lexical bundles in a text. What the program does is you upload a list of lexical bundles to the program and you upload a corpus. The program works with the list, goes into the corpus uploaded, and it converts the corpus files into Google Docs, highlighting the bundles from the list. So very simply, if you have this introduction, which is the introduction, this is an introduction from a, a paper in ESP that was published a couple of years ago, and you, this is part of the corpus that you upload to LBMAP, with, together with the list of bundles, when you click on start, it gives you this. 
So the list of bundles that I uploaded to LBMAP was a list of three word bundles and LBMAP found them in this introduction and highlighted them. I think that for teaching purposes, applications like this one are very useful, particularly for the teachers, because when you are creating materials, it's very troublesome to find examples where the bundles appear, particularly where more than one bundle appear at the same time. So this is going to save a lot of time. We are currently working on the interface to make it a bit more user-friendly so that you can in fact click and get your files uh, with the highlighted bundles. But the program will be available soon as an application with LB app. LB app is a program that we created to identify lexical bundles that is free and you can download at that link. Um, the, you might be thinking why another program to identify bundles? Well, our program takes care of overlapping bundles, meaning that whatever list of bundles you get, you can be sure that there is no, um, it, that there is independence of observation, that all your three word bundles are gonna be three word bundles and not inside longer expressions, the same with larger sizes. So if you get four word bundles, they are not gonna be, uh, they are not gonna have, they are not gonna be inside any five word bundles or six or seven, which is something that I'm always worried about. Well, so I wanna continue working on the development of computer software for linguistic analysis, but particularly for material design for language teaching classes. And, um, and also on, a, on, on my research area, I want to study lexical bundles in specialized registers, because I have been working with academic writing, research articles, research um, in article reviews, book reviews for a long time, but there are so many registers in ESP um, that need to be explored from a formulaic language perspective that I want to devote some time to that. Finding connections between these expressions and the communicative purpose they convey, either by looking at moves, steps, or by looking at semantic prosodies and preferences. And that's going to be everything for today. I'm open to questions. Well, thanks very much, Viviana. I'm sure. Um, everybody watching around the world really appreciated everything that you presented today. It's always a really popular topic among corpus linguists and amongst people. So around. I saw your last article that found out that lexical bundles came up as a very frequent term. Okay. Yeah. I'm like, wow, I never, sure you know, when I started working with bundles, Peter, I never expected them to become such a popular construct. It's just something, I guess, that people see as um, something, that's something that corpora can provide really very simply and really very it easy. And it it's, one of, it's one of the first things that anyone using corpora probably is exposed to, I imagine. Um, one of the Oh, one I of the see first. a lot of people. I see a lot of people that I know. Hi. Yeah, it's always <laughs> fun. We've got, we, I think we counted up to 144. Wow. At the top level. So, I never um, expected so many people. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, we always, well, we also never expect the numbers that we're going to get, but we still get them. There's a lot of interest in, in the field. Uh, there's a lot of interest in your topic. And I've got quite a few questions collected from the audience in the chat that I hope uh, we'll have time to go through. Uh, and then if anyone wants to also uh, unmute their mic and tune in and ask a question directly, then that's also fantastic. Uh, we'll start off with a question from Mustafa, who asks about, um, in terms of the identifying lexical bundles, which I think is just such an, a contentious area of corpus linguistics. And the reason I mentioned this is because I just had a PhD student who passed. And so I've gone through the supervising all of the different possible combinations of what a, a multi-word unit is and a lexical bundle is and an n-gram and all of the various differences between them are so difficult to categorize There's so many different ways of doing it. Uh, but most of his question is about uh, that you uh, used range as a criteria. Uh, why was range used and not dispersion? 
Well, there, I don't think that there is much difference between range and dispersion, um, but for some people there might be. Um, yeah. I do think that, um, that you need to have some measure of um, variety across texts, okay? Yeah. So I don't care what you call it and I don't care what it is, but you really need to be careful because sometimes if the, the um, percentage of text or the number of text is too high, you may be losing some frequency in bundles, okay? So imagine you have a corpus that has 400 text and you say, I'm gonna use 10%, okay? Because it's, now it's fancy to use a percentage. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna use 10%. 10% of 400 is 40. And if your cutoff for, point for frequency is 20, you are losing all the bundles in the frequency between 40 and 20 that yeah. perhaps are important. So it all depends also on what your research question is and what you want those bundles for. If you want those bundles for teaching, probably you want to look at what the function is, and that's going to be more important uh, uh, than other things. And so, I mean, I have worked with like a five range, and it, it's never bothered me because, yeah. because usually my frequencies are very high. Yeah. So if your frequency is high, then if your frequency is high, then your range is going to be high too. Because, I mean, in, a, in depending on the on the on the text, nobody uses an expression twenty times in one paper. Okay, so it's like if your range is twenty or forty, you are gonna have the, the some dispersion. A lot of people are gonna be using that expression. So, yeah, agree. And I, I, again, it, I think it's a great question, and, and it does just point to the complexity of research in this area. And absolutely, so but many I also different think, definitions, isn't that? I also think that it's important that one, if you are respectful of the frequency of the bundle, then working with your own conventions, it's okay. OK, so if you if you disclose that this is what you are doing and you are calling 100%. these bundles because the frequency is high, which, in fact, I think that 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 is the only thing that you need to to be careful yeah. about, that the expression is really frequent. OK, well, I just hope that your reviewer agrees with that at the same time. Maybe. <laughs> OK, thank you. I've got another question from Manuel, who says that although you mentioned corpus based teaching did not return significant improvement in the EAW teaching methodology, do you consider that applying textual genres and lexical abundance was beneficial for students learning? I I consider it beneficial for me because it was very easy to teach that class. But the students perceive this as very motivating and their writing improved in both courses. So I don't see any detriment, okay, anything wrong in teaching with a corpus. Um, I'm gonna tell you something that when I started teaching that class at Iowa State, other colleagues wanted to try it out. And by the end of the second year, I think 80% of the teaching teaching that class was teaching of the professor teaching that class was teaching with that syllabus. Yeah. And I remember a, a very dear colleague of mine who I'm not going to mention by name, but he is an, an outstanding researcher in the applied linguistics field who was teaching that class. He said, That's that class is so easy to teach. Sometimes I feel ashamed because the students are working on their own and they are so into it, into analyzing the papers. I just walk around the class to see what they are doing because everybody was working on their stations. Yeah. And, um, and then I do email, mm. okay? Because it was like, I, don't, I really don't want to be like going around too, too many times because it was bothering the students. So it's like, then I come back to my computer and I do other work and I'm like, and I feel guilty because I shouldn't be doing that. And I'm like, no, that no, means that you did things exactly right, okay? Exactly, yeah. uh, exactly. I've also had similar experiences in the past and it's almost like, you know, go away, leave us alone. We're, exactly. We're I had learning it. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you this story that's very really short. I had, a, I had a student who was from Argentina too. Okay, so it's like we had like that bond. Um, and by the end of the semester, he said, I'm taking, the, I'm taking the program with me. And I'm like, oh, you can, because it's mine. So you can take, make a copy on a, on a, on a, on a drive or, or put it on, a, on something and take it with you. 
a couple of semesters later, we met and he said he had already graduated and he had come back for an event at the university and he said, I still use your program to look at um, other things that I need to write for my job. Okay, and I'm like, well, then I'm done. Because in fact, that is what I was trying to teach. I mean, I didn't know, you know what? I, it comes to the idea that we really don't know what good writing is or what better writing is, but we can all say what bad writing is or what worse writing is. So I think that I try to teach students a research methodology to analyze writing. Now from that to saying that that writing was going to get much better, that is something that probably is very difficult to measure. Yeah, uh, and that's a perennial problem, not just with uh, corpus-based studies, but actually academic writing in general. So Absolutely. thanks for that. Uh, I've got a question then from uh, Thang, I believe it's pronounced, but correct me if I'm wrong, I do apologize. Um, question relates to range for prosody analysis. How far would you go or could you go in, in, for example, a phrase or even a full clause that could be considered sufficient for analysis? No, sometimes you have to go beyond the clause, beyond the sentence. Sometimes you do, because I mean, sometimes the bundle is referential and the reference is far away. So you really need Long to go where, wherever it is. Yeah. Yes, sure. yes, yeah. yes, yes. And, and, and that's also has a lot to do with what you are doing. If you are doing a study for describing a register, for example, then probably you are going to need a couple of raters and you're going to need to do like as much as you can. If you are going to do it for your classroom, probably you need to work with the materials that you decided for your class and, and maybe your own perception and that of your students can help you with the prosodies. Okay, but, um, but I mean, it's, I, I, I think that yes, that many times you have to go beyond the cloth and beyond the sentence. And I guess my question as a follow-up then would be, how, how does using corpora handle it when you go above that level? Well, usually what you do is um, you, you at random select a percentage of your instances and, and you can do like a, a couple of random analysis. So let's say you are gonna do 20%, but you do, or 20, I don't know, 4% and you do like a, a, a bunch of analyses separately. And then you, um, you do some measure of um, like some correlation to see how, how, um, your rating was and also how the processes or the preferences come. Okay, so it's like if you have millions of examples, you are not gonna be able, I mean, the functional analysis, it's still manual. Okay, I mean, there are many um, programs out there that work with sentiment analysis and a lot of other anal semantic analysis yes. that I am still a bit, let's say, concerned about. So um, I'd rather go with something a bit more manual with a bunch of human people that I train or that are well-trained and, and look, look at a percentage and, and go with that, okay? Probably, probably stating a limitation, but I, I think that that is much more reliable. Okay, and I guess um, we'll probably finish it there as we're just on the hour. Um, so again, let's thank our speaker, everybody, um, Professor Viviana Cortez, and just a quick shout out to next week's speaker and the last in our current series at present, and that is uh, Dr. Elena Kotos, the Iowa State University, who will be joining us uh, Tuesday again, so save the day. Same time as usual, however, and her seminar will be on corpus and genre-based automated write writing evaluation for scientific writing, which again, if you uh, the, the paper that mine came out, uh, not this week, but a couple of weeks ago on written corrective feedback research, you'll see that automated writing evaluation is one of the uh, up and coming topics in, uh, in 
feedback research. And it's going to be very interesting to see how Elena presents Corpora as part of the solution there. So, uh, but that's for next week. Before we get there, though, let's thank our speaker again one last time. And uh, um, yeah, thanks very much for everything. And we'll see you again this time next week. So I'm going to kill the recording here. And uh, anybody else then, if you want to tune in and say hi to Viviani yourself, then feel free to do so. The recording will be made available probably in about the next 12 hours or so. Thanks, everyone.